Women's Work is a special podcast production from Boise State Public Radio and the Mountain West News Bureau. This episode was recorded on the ancestral lands of the Crow, the Blackfoot Confederacy, and the Salish, Kootenai, and Pendere tribes. These nations and others inhabited these lands for millennia before white settlers arrived in the late 1800s. Their historical and cultural relationships with the land continue to this day. The Lannons live in the Paradise Valley, not far from Bozeman, Montana, in a little red and white farmhouse with a wraparound porch that looks out over cow pastures and snowy mountains in the distance. We're hungry, I know. I said you were hungry. We need some Malloy and Papa. Check, that's it. Hey. Malloy Lannon comes out to meet me with her dog, Chuckwheat, at her heels when I arrive on a cool spring afternoon. You're going to go inside if you bark at them. She's 14. Dark, curly hair, short on the sides of her head, but longer and wild on top. Kind of punk rock. She has hazel eyes, and most days she wears Carhartts and baggy t-shirts. In a pen near the house, there are four sheep. Three with black faces, and one very rotund, very disgruntled, white sheep. Well, hi, Babette. I am here to meet that sheep. Wait, will you just tell me really quick, who is Babette? Um, Babette is my pregnant you. So she'll be um, lambing here soon. Sorry. Like any minute. Any minute, yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Is this your first lambing? Yes. Are you nervous? Uh, yeah. I'm still figuring things out. Okay. I'm Ashley Ahern, and this is Women's Work stories about the changing face of ranching in the West. There's a lot riding on Babette and her new lamb. Malloy's folks, Megan and Pete Lannon, are cattle ranchers who are taking a different approach to how they graze their land. We'll get to that in a bit. But they don't know much about sheep. The sheep are Malloy's thing and she plans to grow her flock lamb by lamb and graze them the way her parents do. Babette's baby will be the first member of the new generation of the flock, Malloy's first foray into ranching on her own, running a business, taking responsibility for livestock and the land. Malloy goes around behind Babette to look at her swollen udders and vulva. How does it look? I don't see any good on there, that's my only thing. Oh, sorry. Excuse us. So rude. Right. She really, she she's feels, giving us a dirty look. She's like, why were you just looking at me like that? Yeah. She feels attacked. <laughs> we finish checking Babette, feeding the other sheep, and then we go inside. Very exciting. Malloy bought Babette with her own money, but it didn't come from babysitting or a paper route. It came from a coloring book Malloy designed and sold, which turned out to be kind of controversial. Malloy's in the 4-H club, which is like Boys and Girl Scouts for the future farmers of America. Kids raise pigs and cows, and there are competitions and fairs. And at one competition, kids had to explain one aspect of veterinary science. So that usually means explaining vaccines or antibiotic use or other traditional mainstream ways of treating and medicating livestock. But Malloy had a different idea. She decided to explain the concept of adaptive rotational grazing. This kind of grazing involves moving livestock around regularly in a group through a series of smaller pastures, instead of releasing them into one big pasture and leaving them out there for weeks or months, as many ranchers do. Now, some research suggests that if you keep your animals moving, you can prevent overgrazing and boost soil health and grass growth. It's not a brand new concept by any means, but it's been slow to catch on in more conventional ranching circles. Malloy decided to explain this idea using a coloring book designed for little kids. I was like really pumped. I thought I was going to get a really good um, ribbon for it. At the 4-H competition, though, the woman who judged Malloy's coloring book entry wasn't really open to the grazing idea Malloy was trying to explain. So I was explaining each page, and when I was done, I was like, yeah, that's my coloring book. And she's like, okay, well, I'm just going to say this quick. That has nothing to do with animal health. 
you should have done a project on vaccines or how um, you can better this in a different way because this is not how it's going to work. So I was really upset because I worked hard on it, you know. What did that tell you in that, like that, what did that experience teach you about what you'll be up against as you try to do things differently? Um, well, it mainly told me that, you know, it's going to be hard. Lots of people aren't going to change the way that they view it, but it's easier almost sometimes to teach little kids because they don't have an, a, necessarily might not have like an opinion yet. They have, aren't set in their ways, you know? Right? Yeah. yeah. So, Lola, can I put you on the spot and will you tell me what is regenerative agriculture? Oh, God. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> regenerative agriculture is when you're, instead of working against nature, you're working with nature and you're regenerating the land, working with it. You know, you're not trying to just. Um, it's hard one for me. It's so broad, that's what I'm. Malloy's dad, Pete, was sitting at the kitchen table with us, listening quietly as his daughter spoke. He has the same hazel eyes as she does, black hair, and a big mustache that covers his mouth. So, yeah. Malloy, and I'm not trying to give you the answer, but. No. My, or my answer, but what's the one thing I always say as far as taking versus leaving? Um, leave more than you take. Yeah, give back more than you take. And give back more than you take. I think the biggest thing that we're looking at with regenerative ag is that. We're trying to heal the land. We're trying to make it more productive in the long term, not necessarily by putting inputs, but with our management. And so I think the definition of regenerative ag is huge. Now, if I'm being honest, this whole regenerative ag thing has been tough to get my head around. It's a bit of a catch-all phrase used in more progressive ranching circles, and it can mean everything from reducing antibiotic use on livestock to cutting back on herbicides and pesticides, not sending your animals to feedlots. It can mean managing predators like wolves in non-lethal ways, or even just grazing your animals differently in order to put less stress on the land, like the Lannans do. We'll be exploring a bunch of these different practices throughout this series, but I gotta say, as I started researching the regenerative ag movement, you know, I joined listservs and online groups, started talking to folks who run ranch internship programs, and I attended conferences. Anyway, I started to notice something. Women seem to be taking the lead here. That's not to say there aren't men involved, but what emerged for me was a contrast between the more conventional mainstream ranching world, which has long been male dominated, and the women spearheading the regenerative ag movement. Malloy may be one of the movement's youngest members. Okay, what time is it? Uh, 2.47 in the morning. And what are you doing? We're going to check. <clears throat> going to check Babette to see if she is starting the lamb. We go out into the sub-freezing night, and the stars are so bright and crisp. We can hear the sheep in their pasture. Babette's alone in her smaller pen, giving us the dirtiest look when we open the gate. Malloy checks Babette's hind end again. She's really got nothing, do you, Babette? Still no action. Not yet. <laughs> no. Well. <laughs> now what? Now you go back to bed. <laughs> so what is it about this job that you like? <laughs> Waking up in the middle of the night. You just asked me if I like waking up in the middle of the night. Yeah. No. <laughs> I get tired. And I, I don't like that part. I mean, yeah. it's exciting to see if a bet's ready to land, but... If I had to, I don't think I would. If I didn't have to. Yeah. Maybe I should have asked 
what makes you want to do this job for the rest of your life <laughs> in moments like this. <laughs> yeah, I... No, it's exciting. Very exciting. Good night, Bebe. The next morning, Babette's giving us the same disgruntled stare when we check her before Malloy leaves for school. Still no babies. So Malloy's mom, Megan, and I get in the four-wheeler and head out to move cows. I wanted to see what this whole adaptive rotational grazing thing was all about. <laughs> we got a radio this year. That's pretty Woo-hoo. sweet. Megan has short, wavy hair, the color of sun-faded cinnamon, and a compact, solid build. Her phone is always dinging. She's moving a mile a minute most days. And she gets speeding tickets more often than she cares to admit. But when she's working with cows, there's a calmness that comes over her. We're driving out through the pasture, past big pivot sprinklers with hawks perched on their long metal arms. A gopher darts in front of us. The grass is coming up, and the gophers are out in force. Now, some ranchers use poison, smoke, or even explosives to get rid of the rodents in their hay fields. But the Lannans take a more passive, hands-off approach in the ways they manage this land. We found that it costs more time and labor to try and defeat them. It's just like, whatever. But what we have noticed is a lot more hawks um, on the pivots, hunting them in the summer. It's pretty awesome. They kind of keep them thinned out. They pretty much take care of take care of that. Just some of that stuff isn't worth fighting, I don't think. We cross a creek and pull into a big open pasture, maybe the size of a few football fields, and Megan shuts off the four-wheeler. A group of black and red cows turn and look at us from one section of the pasture. Now, on most of the more conventional ranches I've seen, cows will be given free run of a pasture like this, basically to spread out across the whole thing. But Megan and Pete are doing things differently. This pasture is divided into much smaller sections, each one about half the size of a basketball court. A single line of electric fence keeps the cows in this small section. Picture it kind of like racking up pool balls on a pool table. Megan and Pete's cows are clustered densely on a small section of pasture. But on most ranches, it looks more like after the break, when the pool balls, or cows in this case, are scattered all over. The key here is that these cows get moved onto a fresh section of grass just about every single day. And that allows each pasture to rest before the cows rotate back and graze it again. Megan explains this as she's filling up a water trough. They're not staying in here for an extended amount of time, so they're not eating where they poop necessarily. But what it's doing is they're laying down a lot of manure. And so they're leaving that behind, but they move every day. So they get a fresh piece of grass every day. This may seem counterintuitive, that keeping cows together on a smaller chunk of land actually makes the land healthier overall. But Megan says there are some key benefits to this type of grazing. When you concentrate your livestock in one place, they tend to graze it more evenly. They eat everything in front of them. Think about cows sort of like spoiled kids. If they have their choice, they'll pick at what's on their plate, right? Like maybe just eat the mac and cheese and leave the broccoli. But if there are more of them competing for the food on a smaller plate, they won't cherry pick the good stuff. In this tight pasture, Megan's cows eat whatever's available, the weeds and the grasses alike. They're having to almost move together in that herd, but like as a lawnmower. So watch when we turn them in, and they really do this in the summer. They will all come into the paddock. They all go down together. Then they start coming back. And they do that all day long. And so what they're doing is that they're not picking and choosing the best. They're picking what they've got. And then they move on. Now, there is a bit of scientific debate about how effective this kind of grazing actually is. Some research suggests that when done correctly, it can increase soil health and boost carbon and nitrogen sequestration. 
but other research suggests that it may not be a silver bullet solution to overstressed land, especially in arid regions, or if there are too many animals grazing it total. There is one thing I can say, though, after visiting a whole bunch of different ranches for this series. No two ranches are the same. The conditions are different. The climate and weather patterns are different. The numbers and breeds of cows are different. Heck, even the plants are different. So coming up with a definitive statement about the best way to graze livestock that applies across the board is almost impossible. There is no one right way. Ranching is about adaptation, assessing the conditions, and then making adjustments. It's not a controlled science experiment, unfortunately. For Megan, switching to adaptive rotational grazing has made her land and soil healthier, right down to the bugs. There's some over here. She crouches down next to a cow patty, grabs a stick, and starts poking around in the poop. They probably do like it a little warmer, but... She's looking for dung beetles. They're kind of slow. I might see some in there. If your manure is crawling with them, that's a good sign that you're fostering a healthy ecosystem. I see a few in there, the holes. It's still cold at this time of the year, early spring, so there's not much beetle activity, she says. But in the summer, it's crazy. They're like little rototillers, basically. Yeah, and they just like, burrow, tunnel, move it. The beetles break the manure down so the nutrients can be more readily absorbed into the soil, and the grass can bounce back faster between grazing rotations. It'd be cool if we could just... We look up from our manure pile and see an orderly row of red and black cows staring at us expectantly. They kind of look like, um, you know, before you go into a concert and you're all like waiting with your tickets. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Megan turns off the electric fencing, fires up the four-wheeler, and we start rolling slowly to the next pasture. Hey, boss! She calls to her cows, and sure enough, they all start following us. Hey, boss! So they get very excited. Oh, there's land whale. See her? Megan points out her favorite cow, land whale. Wait, which, this is your favorite? You see her right dead in front of me. Yes, she's huge. That's land whale. <laughs> she's, I think, 15 years old. Wow. Look she's your favorite? She is my favorite. Look, I mean, look at her, her physique. It's amazing. <laughs> we get the cows into the new pasture, and Megan stops the four wheeler. Why did you stop? So you can hear them eat. I think this must be one of Megan's favorite sounds. In a way, it's the sound of success. Healthy cows chomping away at lush, thick, healthy grass. Yeah, like I love that in the summer and Pete will be like, what is taking you so long? And I'm like, I just like to lay out here and listen to them eat. You know what I mean? Like it's like my favorite. Um, you know, it's funny, Malloy, um, when she and I were talking the other day, she was like, or she was leaving for school, and she was like, you know, if you just want to relax, you can go sit in the, in the sheep paddock with them, because that's where I, I go to relax sometimes, and you basically said, like, the exact same thing, in other words, so the mother-daughter <laughs> bond is strong. It is, right? Go <laughs> with the animals. Go listen. It's really yeah. calm there. But I think for so many women, we're not good at carving out our time, because we're so busy helping everybody else get their get what they need, get the places they need to go, you know, soccer practice. I've watched you just hustle the past few days, you know, and this feels like yours somehow. Yeah, it do, and it, it totally does. And that's like, even with Pete, sometimes he's like, I just want to go check the cows. I'm like, okay, see you later. Like, it's like our little getaway, like we can go hang out with our cow gang, you know, um, because they don't ask for much. It's new grass and some water. They're pretty easy. Yeah. Do you think that um, being a woman, you're different at ranching or your style, your approach is different? I totally think so. How? Um, I think the way we see things, it's, it's not like one's better than the other, but I think, I think that's what makes like Pete and I a really good match is because I'll catch something that he missed and he, you know, will catch something I missed. Um, and I think that... What I see differently, um, like, are the little things, like, I, you know, when I talk about the birds or, um, 
the subtle changes I, I feel like in the landscape, I, I feel like I notice. Um, I might articulate them a different way, right? But I think that it's a, it's just a softer balance where you're in the ecosystem and you're not doing to it. Yeah, don't brute force it. Yeah, don't brute force it. Hmm. So I think that that is, I think that's what I've seen a lot of um, women that I've met that really bring to this industry. That feels new, you know. Before dinner that night, Malloy and I go out to check on Babette again. Hey, Babette, if you have your baby tonight, and like early in the morning, I won't have to go to school. <laughs> We're greeted by the same cold stare from a sheep that looks more and more like a floofy, disgruntled meatloaf on toothpicks. Like, there's some goo on there. I can't tell if that's like just some residue. Oh, no touchies. Sorry, Babette. No touch. Malloy's trying to get a look at Babette's backside again to see if she's any more swollen or oozing. Can I just look at your back end, lady? She's like, no, to the wall. It's like into the corner. Okay. So her personality's pretty different from the others? Yeah. Oh, good girl. Like, I see a little bit of residue on there. I don't know if that's like a... Hold on. How are your nerves tonight? I don't think I. I'm so. I'm I'm tired enough where I don't have nerves. <laughs> nerves are <laughs> nerves are a luxury you don't have. <laughs> we go back inside where Malloy's parents and younger brother Liam are in the kitchen getting ready for dinner. And Pete asks about Babette. And like a little, like, I think a tiny bit of goo, but that also could be just me really wanting it to happen. I looked at her today, and she's looking pretty loose in the rear end. Yeah? Yeah. I bet she lambs within the week. That's not what I wanted to hear. I know, but this, you okay. can't, you can't make it happen. I mean, you could. I can force you Babette to lamb <laughs> by sheer will. In general, you're just trying to force something to happen. Those labors don't typically go very smoothly. Mm. So you just mm -hmm. have to wait. We'd finished dinner and Liam had gone to bed at this point. He's super into motorcycles and dirt bikes, and he says he wants to become a racer or a bike mechanic when he grows up. Megan and Pete say there will always be a place for both their kids on the working ranch. But at this point, Malloy seems to be showing more interest in ranching. She's been the one who's like, made her business and had her sheep and all that and puts the effort into it and it's, it's cool and not that Liam isn't into it or doesn't contribute but he's he has in, other interests and that's fine but I think that Malloy has more of a connection to the ranch and the land than Liam does. Is it hard for you at all as a dad? Pete looks down at the kitchen table. Crying? Poppy. Cry. Cry. <laughs> Poppy doesn't cry often. It's because he's proud of you. <laughs> you gotta stop first. <laughs> No, it's Can't not it's not me. hard for me from a perspective of like, oh my son isn't as into this as my daughter. That isn't that isn't hard for me. <laughs> stop it, stop it. No, I'm very proud of you. It's a good thing. Yeah. So to answer your original question without crying, um, I'm not disappointed. I'm very happy. I'm very proud of Malloy. 
and you know Liam might change his mind and not be a motorcycle mechanic or motocross guy later that's fine too but if he, that's what he chooses that's that's all good we're all given choices in life The next day, after the kids had left for school, Megan went out to check on Babette. She was rolled over on her side in the pasture, and Megan knew it was time. So she got Malloy out of German class to be there for the birth. So what do you see? What's going on? You can see the baby's nose, and it's at two feet, so it looks like it's positioned right and coming out. The other sheep are freaked out. How do you know not to help her? Because I can see that um, the two Hooves, front hooves are coming out and the head's positioned right and you can see the nose and they're all coming out together. So that tells me that her, the baby's head's not crooked back or not one leg's pushed back. It should, it's going right. Oh, you can hear. It's her pushing. I was uh, in the middle of German. Like, I'm like, yeah, but back. Got me out of German. <laughs> I'm shaking. I'm so excited. That's what I do. Good girl. Oh, there you go. You almost see the eyes. Come on, come on. Push, lady, push. Oh, that's a good one, Babette. That was a good push. Oh, Babette. You can see the eyes. Yeah, good girl, Babette. Oh, yeah, one more right there. Right, right there, right there. There you go, girl. Oh, I know. Oh, this is so cool. Babette greets her new baby. It's a girl. She feels good, Mama. This spring, when the temperatures rise and the grass comes in bright and green, Babette and her new lamb will be out there grazing in a tight flock, rotating through different pastures each day, just like the Lannan's cows do. And Malloy believes her family's ranch will be healthier for it. Next episode, how can ranchers help migratory birds? Or maybe a better question, how do ranchers and birders get along? Like I say, I don't, I don't bird, I don't really relate to birders. I know like three species of birds on a good day. We're heading to Burns, Oregon to meet a rancher who might be providing some of the last best habitat for birds in a drought-stricken west. Women's work is edited by Whitney Henry Lester. Sound design is by Liza Yeager. Art for the series is by Katie Michael. Special thanks to the Native American Studies Department at Montana State University for help with the land acknowledgement you heard at the top of this episode. <laughs>